So we've talked about these things in culture clash, and, and the goal was to move on to a different topic. Uh, I'll, I'll blame this one, one on me. I didn't get a chance. I, I, there's, a, there's something that I want to do before we get on uh, the topic uh, of racial equality and things going on with race. Uh, and, and really, it's, it's to get perspective and to grow in wisdom before I get up here and share with you. And so I'm going to do that this week. And so we're going to bring, I'm going to bring a different topic for you uh, this morning. And I want to talk this morning, again, thinking about culture, thinking about worldview. Let's see if my clicker works. Yeah. Right? I want to talk about the sanctity of life. Okay? Now, when I talk about the sanctity of life, when I use that term, what really one word will we boil this down to? Sanctity of human life is really a movement against what? Abortion. abortion right? So we're going to talk this morning about abortion. And I want to preface this a little bit with saying this is not uh, a message to shame anyone. Right? This is not a message where we get to get up and point fingers and, and use Scripture to make people feel bad about themselves. Scripture will divide. You know, so Scripture reveals truth. It reveals hearts. Right? Hebrews tells us that. It cuts straight down to the bone and marrow. And so what I want to do this morning is talk about the worldview, the secular worldview on, on things like abortion, but also what God says and what we should be saying and doing uh, in relation to this. And if you are in the room this morning, if you've experienced this, if this is part of maybe your history, your testimony, uh, know this, that there is forgiveness for that, uh, there's healing for that, and God can use anything and everything. Uh, for his good and for his purposes. And so, again, this is not an opportunity uh, to bash anyone, look down on anyone. It simply is an opportunity for us to make sure we understand what a Christ-centered worldview or what a Christ-centered view looks like when it comes to these topics. And now, this morning, for the topic of abortion. So, a quote came to mind when I was putting this together. Uh, I had to look it up to see who it was by because I could think of the quote, couldn't think of the author. And it comes from John Wesley. John Wesley says this, that what one generation tolerates, the next generation will embrace. You guys ever heard that, that phrase? And I've heard you know, different variations of it, but what one generation tolerates, the next generation will embrace. So you think about this topic of abortion, this, this the topic of sanctity of life. What was kind of the, the milestone for abortion in terms of this country, when it was legalized, all that stuff? You guys remember there's a court case? What was that court case? Roe versus Wade, you guys probably heard about that. What year? You guys know what year? This is just trivia morning. Close. 73, I believe, right? Okay. 1973. Some of you guys were, were, were around in 73, right? Okay. I was not. I'm just going to throw that out this morning. Okay. Uh, but uh, 73, that was a long time ago, right? I'm, I'm feeling kind of old. I wasn't around then. Some of you guys ran in 73. Maybe remember those days. That was a little bit of time ago. That was really a couple generations ago. Well, I bring that up not, to, not to, to play any old jokes here, but 1973, Roe v. Wade is passed. Abortion is legalized. You know when a, a abortion reached its peak in the United States? Basically, a generation later, and this is kind of my generation, 1997 is when we hit our peak for number of abortions in the United States. Now, now thank God that it's been declining ever since. Okay, we'll talk more about that here in a second. But you think about it, about 20, 25 years later, a generation later, what one generation tolerated and passed in this law and let become law, the next generation embraced. And that next generation, 25 years later, we see the peak of abortions in the United States. Right? Kind of goes back again to what John Wesley said. I think it makes sense. But what we tolerate, what we allow, what we don't stand up for, what we don't speak against, especially as Christians inside the church, we'll see that embraced and we'll see it grow in the next generation. That's why it's important for us to talk about these things together as a church family, together as families at home, to make sure we know what we believe. So we're standing up for the Word of God and we're standing against the things that don't belong in our hearts, in our lives. Now, I mentioned just a second ago that, that abortions and teen pregnancies are on the decline. And in fact, they had another kind of trend showing from 1997 to 2017. And in 2017, we actually hit like the lowest point for abortions in the United States. It was, it was lower than the 70s where it really ramped up into the 80s and 90s. It's dropped below kind of that line, which is amazing, which is good, which is great. But the reason that we talk about stuff like this, the reason that abortion is still a topic, especially for those of us in the church, is that one abortion is too many. Right? Killing the unborn, killing the preborn in the womb is wrong. And one abortion is too many. Another reason we have to talk about this is, is really the very reason that we brought all these topics up 
is that there's, there's a different angle, there's a different view, there's a secular worldview in which abortion has become a right. Remember what, what one generation tolerates, the next generation embraces, and now in this generation it's been around so long that abortion has become a right. I found this, uh, you probably can't see it out there, but I'll kind of explain it a little bit. The title of this graph, and I really didn't even read the article, I just read the title of the graph and thought it was interesting. It says, 29 states were hostile or extremely hostile to abortion rights in 2017. Only 12 were supportive. And so you read that title and it's kind of a lament that what? That not enough people and places are supportive of the right of abortion. And again, what does that tell you? It tells you that there is a, a message out there, there is, there is a worldview out there that is trying to push abortion, trying to push the, the, the degradation of the sanctity of life, right? It's trying to erase that. It's trying to promote abortion. It wants people to be supportive of it. And there's a lament, I, I think, in the title of this article that not enough people see abortion as a good thing, Right? That's the world that we live in today. That's the world we've lived in for quite a while, but this is still going, and it's still going, and it's permeating, and it's growing, and the church needs to know it, see it, and stand against it. And I will say this, congratulations, Oklahoma. If you look in the middle of this map, you can see it. There's an orange line right down the middle of our nation. What does that orange line represent? Orange on this graph represents those states who are basically aggressively against and hostile towards abortion. So good job. Right? There's a little bit of positive we can take away from that. But again, one abortion is too many. And so while we can be hostile against it and push against it, we cannot stop. We cannot let it normalize. We can't just say, well, that's a part of life now. Because that's exactly what will happen in our generation. Right? We'll tolerate it and we'll see it grow in the next generation. So we talk about things like abortion. We talk about this, uh, this concept, this idea of sanctity of life. It's huge, and it ties back into what we even talked about last week, how we are made in the image of God, right? He is creator, we are creation. And really, I think what it ties down to with sanctity of life and abortion is it ties down to, to control, right? We want control. What do we want control over? We want control over, basically, life itself. Right? And so we give permission, right? We, we, we allow people to kill their unborn children uh, without really any sense of responsibility, right? W without any repercussion, without any remorse. And, and, and here's the thing, that's how it's billed, right? As a right, as just a procedure, as just a process. But if you're in the room this morning, if you've experienced it, if you know someone who's gone through it, you know that really that's not true. You can't really go through this process of abortion and not feel anything. Uh, I really have yet to, to read uh, and find anyone where they say, well, I'm just completely, basically numb uh, and, and innocuous to it, right? It, it, it affects you. It's meant to affect us because that's how we're created. We're created in the image of God, and he is a God of life. And when we take life and we, and we destroy that life, we end that life, we give ourselves permission to do it, it can't not affect us. And again, that's another reason we have to talk about this, another reason that we have to, to speak out against things like abortion. Make sure culture knows that the Christ-centered view is not the same. It doesn't, it doesn't jive, right? It doesn't go together. One reason, too, the last kind of reason before we get into this, I think it's important, because we can talk about abortion and numbers and statistics, and I'll give you a few more of those here in a minute. We talk about the people that are involved and the groups that are involved, but ultimately the reason we have to talk about this, and I think it's probably the most important reason, is that things like abortion, right, especially when it comes to life and our relationship between creator and creation, it's a spiritual battle. This is a spiritual thing. If we had more time to talk about it, just sit down and, and just go through all this stuff that uh, I was reading this week and, and last night and this morning, you can see how this has been a, a long-term spiritual war. with Many battles fought in it, lots of casualties involved in this one. But I thought about this scripture that Paul writes to the church in Ephesus from Ephesians chapter 6. And he reminds them that, that our battle, that our fight, the, the, the ESV says, wrestle. Right? Maybe you guys ever been in a wrestling match. Says, Listen, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Who does Paul say that we fight against? You guys heard this one? We fight against powers and principalities. What, is, what does he mean by that? It goes on to say 
against cosmic powers over this present darkness. Cosmic power, he's talking about spiritual forces at play that are in this dark world around us that are, are moving and shaping the hearts and minds of people and pushing them into things like abortion, pushing them into things we've already talked about, you know, like the, you know, gender confusion, pushing them into things like rebellion and, and hatred. We have spiritual forces at play that are seeking to divide us, that are seeking to keep us angry and frustrated, that are seeking to keep us battling each other so that we don't realize who the real enemy is. And that's how he ends that verse, is against spiritual forces in the heavenly places. And so we talk about things like abortion, we talk about all these different topics in, in, in this whole series of Culture Clash, we ultimately must be reminded that this, these are spiritual battles. So we must approach them in a spiritual way. Now, we are only equipped to do so when we approach it how? In and through God's Word. All right? We can't do this on our own. We shouldn't do this on our own. We shouldn't even approach these topics with just human emotion and ambition. They must be seen through the lens of God's word, through his power, by putting on the whole armor of God. All right? When we are walking in him, girded up by his truth, we've got his, his word at our side, then we're ready to, to go and make our appeal and fight our battles. And so that's what, again, that's what we're doing when we go through things like this culture clash series. So let's talk about, like we always have done with this series, let's look at what we, what the world would say about abortion. And, and to understand, um, I think the impact of abortion, uh, but probably more than the impact, probably the purpose of abortion, you've got to go back a few more decades, even before 1973. And you got to look at the foundation uh, of an organization. Which, which organization in the United States is responsible for the most abortions? Yeah, you've probably heard of Planned Parenthood, right? and they're by far the number one provider of abortions in the United States. Who was the founder? Lots of quizzes, right? You guys are thinking this morning, who was the founder? Who's the lady whose name is kind of on that organization? Anyone know? Margaret Sanger. So some of you guys have done a little bit of reading, probably a little bit of research on this. Margaret Sanger has some very interesting things to say about the topic of abortion. And it's, it's, it's real purpose in our culture. What's interesting is that she said these things out loud. They're written down. We go to read. And yet people who hold a worldview of abortion don't really seem to understand it. The first word that comes to mind, the first thing we have to talk about with Margaret Sanger is that she was big into eugenics, right? So I know lots of words today. Pastor Matt's still had a lot of questions and trivia. And now we've got a new word for the day, eugenics. Well, eugenics is basically... Uh, it, it's basically selective breeding in the human population. Right? It, it, it's kind of the idea that some people should reproduce and some people shouldn't. And so someone needs to be in control of who's having babies and who's not. All right? it, it, it's a little bit of a, a scary concept, but it fits right in with things like natural selection and evolution and all these things that were kind of coming around at the same time period to say, listen, you know, if, if it's all just a part of nature, if it's all just a process, then we can take control of that process. And we can shape it and mold it and make it do what we want it to do. Right? Humans are good at that kind of stuff. We're good at being bad. We're good at trying to take something and control it and to manipulate it so that it does what we want it to do. Do you guys agree with that? Have you guys maybe experienced that? Maybe at some point in your life you've done that? You've been guilty of being manipulative and controlling and taking power to use for your own purposes. Here's an interesting quote. You see a quote up there. I'm going to come to that one in just a second. Here's a quote I didn't put on the screen. But basically, when asked, Margaret Sanger was asked about this kind of idea of, of eugenics, especially when it comes to certain populations. Right? And they were talking about Certain populations, you know, impoverished populations, things like that. But with a certain group of populations, asked about minorities, her answer was that basically for the minority, minority groups, and this is all minority groups at the time in the United States, see, there's two options for those groups. There's either segregation or sterilization. That was her direct quote. 
So, so the person that founded Planned Parenthood right, said, listen, for minority groups, we either need to segregate them and keep them away from the, the more pure genetic, whatever you want to say, basically that's kind of white supremacist thinking, we need to keep them away from the good breeding stock or we just need to sterilize them and get rid of them. Right? And so you start to see the dark history and the dark past of abortion. Abortion was, was kind of brought in, not created because it's been around for a long time, but it was brought into our culture as a way for people to control populations and other people and to mold culture and society in the image that they felt it should have. And you see now the quote on the screen, it says, Today eugenics is suggested by the most diverse minds as the most adequate and thorough avenue in the solution of racial, political, and social problems. So what is she saying? And what she's saying, I think, is still true today of, of the worldview. The best way to solve a problem is to remove the people who are causing the problem. If it's a social problem... Sure. Yeah, and you, and you think about it, this is something that, that I didn't even write down, but that's a, that's a great point. Uh, there's been a push as of late uh, for those folks like with Down syndrome. Maybe you guys have seen that, that with, with Down syndrome folks, there's been a push to eliminate that. They, they can test for it. They can find it. And they say, well, listen, we can go ahead and, and abort all those babies, and we can go ahead and basically cure the world of things like Down syndrome. Right? And if you ever met someone with Down syndrome, they don't need to be eradicated and, and cured in that way. They're people, and they're wonderful. And yet, you, you read something like this, and, and the world says is that if you're deficient, if you're not who, what, who or what we want, if you're not the right color, if you're not in the right social class, we basically have the right to re-engineer society to get rid of you. And then you look at things like abortion, what's going on in culture today, it disproportionately affects poor folks, minorities and people with disabilities and so what we've done in culture today is we have taken control from god in a sense to say we're going to mold culture and society into our image and make it look the way we think it should look and, and again the solution is going to be for any of our problems is we will simply get rid of those folks because their lives are not as valuable as and then you fill in that blank in comparison their lives are not as sanctified as ours and so we can get rid of them. Yes. No, I told you, you're allowed to talk this morning, Miss Jackie. It's good. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, that's part of the kind of the hidden agenda behind you, the, the test. Not that the tests themselves are bad, but they test you because they want you to have the right to, to, to exercise your right of abortion. Because there is in culture today this understanding that if there's something wrong with your baby, if there's a problem, there is a solution in abortion. And that has become the tool, that has become the normal, and that has become, again, the right that we exercise. It's reshaping, it's, it's been reshaping culture really ever since it was put into practice by Margaret Sanger, Planned Parenthood, really ramped up in 1973 with Roe v. Wade. But that's been the world's, the secular worldview solution. When you have a problem, you, you stamp it out. All right. Uh, some statistics, and again, I know statistics are, are, are numbers and I don't always like giving them, but I, I think it's important for us to understand the impact, what this has done, all right? Uh, since 1973, this is 1973 to 2018, there's been over 61 million babies aborted, all right? That's a lot, 61 million. The, the best numbers we have for more recent numbers, 2017, uh, in 2017 alone, there was 862,320 babies Aborted. What's interesting, the website I was on when I was finding these numbers, as I'm looking at these numbers, scrolling across the bottom of the webpage, it says, abortion is a right. Protect abortion. As they're giving you the numbers on the babies that have been killed in abortion. In the United States, there's one abortion every 96 seconds. 
Every 96 seconds, there's an abortion. And the death and the loss, that's horrific. But perhaps I think what may be worse and what we see really as a result of the worldview of abortion and the spiritual forces, the demonic forces at play, I think it's the indifference that people show. If, if you look at the, the reasons cited for abortions, when you go in for abortion, they make, you, they make you mark down a reason. You mark more than one. 98% of women mark down social reasons. And those social reasons basically include things like you know, money and expenses. It's too expensive to have a child. Uh, time and inconvenience. You know, I, I might lose my job. I don't have enough time to take care of a child. And then usually it's peer influence as well. You know, the, the father of the child wants me to abort. My family won't support me, which are all, you know, terrible things. But a baby then, again, when you compare it to and you find its value, that baby becomes less valuable than all those social things. And, and that's the indifference that we show. People like to talk about, you know, the, 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 the cases in which we, we need abortion. Well, that was 98% are social reasons. 98% basically say it's, it's just inconvenient. One to one and a half percent of abortions are, are, are performed because the mother marked down the risk rape or incest, which is terrible, right? I'm not promoting that in any way, but by, by killing a baby, by killing an innocent child, you've not righted any wrongs committed to the mother. Less than a tenth of 1% is for health reasons for the mother. I hear that one a lot. You watch different debates and things say, hey, you know, sometimes in the case of the health of the mother, there are some doctors who say that abortion never improves the health conditions of the mother. It's never medically necessary. But again, we've created in our culture, in our society, these reasonings. And we've become indifferent to the idea of life. We feel like we have control over it. We feel that it is our right to, to take it up and put it down whenever we want. Uh, in fact, it's the last thing I wrote on this point was that in our culture today, I feel like when we look at life, we, we've turned it into a commodity. It's something to be gained, given away, traded, again, taken up or put down. We are such a consumer-driven society that, that having a baby is almost like getting a new phone. If you don't like that phone, you, you, you take it back and get another, right? It's buying a car, trading a car, it's like stuff. Life has become equated with our things and therefore so devalued that we can end it without a thought. It, it, it's it's kind of scary. And there's a whole lot more to this. There's a lot of different aspects, again, uh, that we could explore uh, but again, say all that to say, in the world, the world's view on abortion is driven by spiritually dark forces that has devalued life to the point where we can end it without a thought, without remorse, and we're told that it's a good thing, and it's dangerous. So we, as Christians, have to talk about what does God say about abortion? What does Scripture tell us about abortion? Here's a great verse right here, James or Jeremiah sorry, chapter 1, verse 5. It says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctify you. I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. As God is talking to the prophet Jeremiah, what is God saying about life? Even life for the unborn. He says that that life matters. That life counts. That life is life. In fact, there's kind of three aspects of that. He says, I knew you. Why does it become easy in culture today? Why does it become easy to abort a child? Because you don't think of it as a child. It's not a person. Right? You don't think of it as having a name or a purpose. God says, listen, Jeremiah, I knew you. You were Jeremiah before you came out of the womb and someone called you Jeremiah. I knew you. God says, I, I sanctified you. What does it mean to be sanctified? To be set apart. God says, I, I've already got a purpose for you. I've already set you apart. I already know what you're going to do and how I'm going to use you. That is the value that, that God puts on life. It's not just this human is born and God says, I better figure out a plan for this guy. I better use him somewhere. It's not a commodity. It's not a good to be traded, given or taken. He says, listen, I've sanctified you. I've set you apart. 
I've got a plan and a purpose for you. And again, as we think about culture's view of life, we don't think of life that way in our culture. That that child in the womb is already set apart and has a destiny. We don't think about that. Last word there, he says, I, I ordained you. What does it mean to be ordained? We, we use that word a lot in, in the church. It's not really a word we use out in culture much. But to be ordained means what? Basically to be recognized. There's a, a call on your life. He says, not only did I, I know you before you were born. You were Jeremiah. You've always been. Not only have I set you apart. I've got a plan and purpose for you. But I'm going to place a calling on your life for you to live out. And it's to be what? A prophet to the nations. Jeremiah was going to be a life that had an impact on other lives. How many of you, being on this planet, have had an impact on at least one other life? Anyone? Anyone say, I've, I've raised a child, I've married a spouse, I smiled at someone today even though they didn't know it because I was wearing a mask. Like, did, 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 you, did you impact someone's life? Yeah. That God has set us, uh, set us apart for that kind of stuff. Because I've ordained you, Jeremiah. And again, without even going into all of Jeremiah's story, which I didn't write down because we didn't really have time for, you go, well, who is this Jeremiah guy? Well, for us, for this moment, it doesn't really matter. What you've got to know is this. Jeremiah's life mattered to God before he was born, before, again, he was out and we could see him and know him and, and shook his hand. God knew him, set him apart, and put a calling on his life. And Jeremiah was going to be someone who impacted others. And I believe that God has that same purpose for every single life on this planet. That is our creator God that gives us purpose to the creation. We are made in his image. We are made for relationship. Uh, and the history itself is replete with stories about people who grew up in poverty, about people who were born into terrible situations that grew up to do amazing things. Every life, every life is valuable. And again, in, in God's economy, we're talking about a Christ-centered worldview. And when God talks about life, he says, that's valuable to me. I've ordained it. I've set it aside. It is good. Another scripture I want to look at real quick uh, comes from Psalm 139. This is David now talking. and He's got some great insight about his his worth and value to God. Psalm 139, starting in verse 13, says, For you formed my inward parts, you covered me in my mother's womb. And, and what's the response to this? David's saying, basically, before, before I was made, before you know, when, the, when the bun was still in the oven, and I was still cooking, he says, verse 14 says, I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. What does David recognize about life? Life is awesome. The way these bodies are made, the way that we operate, there's so many things we can't explain about our workings, even in secular science, and they've studied it. You know, our whole cognitive abilities and things like that. That's not explained by the creation. It's only explained by the creator. And David says there is such an amazing value and even mystery and just an amazingness to life, I can't do anything but praise you. Life is just simply amazing. When's the last time we sat back and had that existential moment where we go, life's amazing? You ever done that? You ever looked at your hand and told your finger to move and go, how did I do that? You guys ever get bored and do that? That's just me in my office. It's probably spent too much time alone. But you can just right now, you can make your finger move. How, how did you do that? You don't know, but you just did it, Right? And there's some just kind of simple yet amazing things to life, right? How these bodies work. Again, how our minds work, how our heart works, how our relationship with God works. And so as Christians, as we're reading through God's word, we, we have to have that reaction that life simply is wonderful and amazing. I've got to praise God for it. Now, again, how does that compare to the, to the world's view on things like life and abortion? Well, it's, it's the opposite. They say that, that, that life is, again, something to be bought or sold. We assign value to it. We control it. And David says, no. God made me. God put me together. I don't know how any of that works, but it's, it's just, it just blows my mind. And it's amazing. You keep reading. It says, I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works that my soul knows very well. 
It says, my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Now, what does that mean? Do babies come from like trolls and holes in the ground and things like that? It was weird movies we watch and bedtime stories. No, he's talking about the womb. Because the womb's a dark place. You guys have all been there. You don't remember it, right? But he's like, you know, he's comparing it to like being in the ground. I'm being, I'm being cooked in the oven. He goes, when I was in the deep, dark parts of the earth, which is my mom's womb, right? Before I had form, this is what I think is interesting, right? It says, your eye saw my, stuff, my substance being yet unformed. It says, and in your book, they were all written the days fashioned for me, when as yet there was none of them. He says, before I had arms and legs, before I had fingers and toes, before I looked like any kind of a human being, before I had any kind of substance, what does he say? God knew him. What does that tell you about when life starts? It starts at conception. It starts when, when, when that, that new DNA sequence begins and then there's all that good teacher garbage I know you guys don't want to hear right and meiosis and all that that wonderful jazz but as soon as that happens there is a new and separate and wonderful entity that that God has already known and still knows and has a purpose and plan for and will know he goes before I had any kind of body before I was born before again anyone knew me by my name God knew me and not only did he know me but but he valued me so much but he already planned out and purposed out my days. He's given me, again, that destiny. He's ordained me to do things. God values me and loves me that much. I'm not something simply, again, to be gained or discarded, traded. Life's not a commodity. It's super valuable to God. And David is amazed by it. He's blown away by it. And he's making sure other people know it as well. So we talk about things like abortion. We talk about sanctity of life we should be in awe of the life that God has given us his creation how it works that he's in control of it right? and we should praise him for it and we should be quick to speak of it that life belongs to God and it's super valuable and it's super important and never ever ever should we think for a minute that we can take control of that and that we should alter it change it repurpose it right make abortion and death some kind of tool to be used for our own purposes. And that's going to lead us in the last thing we always talk about. And that's you and me and abortion, right? Uh, the last verse from 139, Psalm 139, I want to share is verse 17. It says, How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How great is the sum of them. And I think of that word precious. This has to be our mindset when we approach any conversation about abortion, any conversation about the sanctity of life, when, when we ourselves are, are, are forming our Christ-centered worldview uh, about abortion and the sanctity of life, when we're going to the, the voting polls to vote for who's going to be you know, representing us in, in, in government, conversations that we're going to have with the people, when I'm putting a sermon together, any time it's going to come to this, this idea and concept of life, this has to be the word we use. Life is precious. Those are the thoughts that God has when he thinks of his creation and the people that he has made. They are precious to him. Do we destroy things that we consider precious? Do we discard them? Do we abuse them? All right? No. No. No is the answer to all those things. When something is precious to us, we protect it. We hold on to it. We're reminded constantly of its value. We talk about it. We share in it. You know, we're, we're excited about it. David says, listen, life is precious to God. The thoughts he thinks towards us, he can't even really describe the sum of, of the thoughts and the purposes that God has for him. He's excited. He's pumped up about that. There is a God in heaven and creator who loves me and thinks about me and thinks I'm a pretty cool guy. And I'm blown away by that. My name is on his lips. We talked about that not too long ago. You ever think about the idea that when Jesus is at the right hand of the Father and he's advocating for us that your name comes off his lips? Straight to the Father's ears. That's how precious 
we are to him. So we think about life. We think about unborn life. And David's already said, listen, before I had arms and legs, when I was just a blob down in that darkness, God knew me. And I was life. And I was precious. And so for us as Christians, we talk about things like abortion. What must our response be? Life is precious. Right? We can never, we can never support abortion in any form. I believe that to be, believe that to be true. And, and, and Charles is going where I'm about to take you. We can never, we can never support abortion in any form. It's never justified, never. And, and if you want to have a conversation about that, well, I'd be glad to sit down with you. I don't think it's ever justified. Never do we have the right to take the decision of life and death into our hands. And people say, well, you know, Christians and abortion, but what about things like the death penalty? Listen, if you've done something to earn the death penalty in your guilt, then, then you get the death penalty. We're not talking about murderers. We're not talking about rapists. We're not talking about the terrible people who have made decisions to violate other people. We're talking about babies in the womb, innocent and precious before God. James 1.27, you guys have heard this one before. James is talking about the tongue before this, right? And he starts off that verse saying, okay, listen, you've got you to bridle that tongue. How many of you guys have got that figured out? Got it figured out? Good, okay? So he, basically he gives us three things in James 1, 27. The first thing he says, take control of that tongue. Got it? Okay, cool. What's the next thing he says? You are to visit or take care of what? Who? Widows and orphans in their distress or in their time of need. He's laying out what real practical faith looks like. He's saying, watch your mouth. He says, go and what? Take care of people who can't take care of themselves. One who are innocent, the ones who are struggling, the ones who need protection because all life is precious. And he ends that verse by saying, keep yourself unspotted from the world. Don't slide into the worldview of things like abortion. Don't ever think that it's okay. And that goes with everything we've talked about. Don't ever think that gender confusion is okay. Don't ever think that open rebellion against your government is okay. All right? But right there in the middle is what I want to talk about just for a second, then we'll be done. Because you hear the word adoption. All right? So I want us to be very practical for a minute. If life is precious to God, we know what is. And so therefore, life is precious to us as Christians. What can we do to promote life in every circumstance and scenario? What can we do? I heard the word adoption. How, how is adoption promoting life? You know, when I get on online stuff and get on social media, which I know is dangerous, that's the number one thing I see for, from non-Christians who support abortion, that you know what, Christians only care about babies until they're born. And we go, no, we don't. We care about everyone. Charles has a point. There's 9,000, roughly 9,300 kids in the foster system in the state of Oklahoma. You know how many churches are in the state of Oklahoma? About that many. If one family from every church in the state of Oklahoma would foster and or adopt a child, you know how many kids would be in foster care tomorrow? Zero. Zero. Now, I'm not up here laying a guilt trip on you. You guys know the pastor, Matt, we do foster care, and we've adopted through foster care. That is our ministry. I, I would encourage you, if you have that opportunity, you do it. Why? Because life is so precious, you don't waste that opportunity. I know some of you are not in the position to do that. So what are some other practical ways, besides maybe taking a child into your home, that you can promote life in every aspect and every scenario? We're just being practical. I know. Pastor Matt's making you talk a lot this morning. We're being practical, though. Sir? Yeah. So maybe you can't take a child into your home, but maybe you can help support someone who can. Maybe you can help support families who you see struggling. Uh, you know, we always say this as kind of like the, the typical church answer we got earlier about you know, Jesus. Are you praying for people? Are you lifting up 
those foster kids, those kids that need home? Are you, are you lifting them up in prayer? Are you praying for the families who can and are helping them? And then are you looking for practical ways to help meet needs in the community? One of the best outreaches we have at Hilltop is our Master Care Food Pantry. And it's a simple thing, but we can give out food. We can feed people. When you're hungry and you have no prospect for where your next meal comes from, things get desperate and things get hard. Simply helping put a meal on the table for a family. Encouraging parents. Again, let, let, let's go even and we'll venture a little bit in the political side of things. Vote for politicians who will support life. I don't like standing up here and telling you who to vote for and things like that. We had those conversations. But if you have a politician that says, you know what, you have the right to kill your child whenever you want to, I don't think you can support that person. Because life is so precious to God, that decision doesn't belong to us. So you look for people who you can support politically. You look for people who you can support that are already in positions of authority. And say, let's support the people who hold that Christ-centered worldview. Let's be practical in helping families who are raising children. Right? Let's offer to alter our lives completely and, and, and take a child that needs a home. I remember not too long ago, again, Kimmy and I was in foster care for a while, and, and, and we knew of a mother, kind of a, it was through another friend of ours, family of ours that does foster care, and the mother had a child. And the mother, and, and, and I don't mean to sound like this sound rude, but the mother was surprised. Oops, basically in front of us, oops, I, I had another child. Well, and I don't want this child. I'm pregnant with it. I've already got a couple. I'm ready to take care of them. And so she goes, I think I'm just going to have an abortion. And she had multiple families say, please don't have an abortion. We will take your child. We'll adopt them, no questions asked. We'll raise them and love them. And that was, that was offered to her. And that was amazing that she had that opportunity. And I'll tell you, and this breaks my heart, she, she received that. She goes, she goes okay, thanks. Yeah, I'll, I'll, we'll, I'll talk to my boyfriend or husband about it. A month later, she has an abortion. It was just easier, simpler. And that's where we're at in culture today. But we must try and strive in every opportunity to protect the sanctity of life, even if that means radically altering and changing our own lives so that we can go out and protect and love and serve those who are at their weakest and have their greatest needs. That should be us. Christ died for our sins. Is there anything we can't or shouldn't do in light of that? Is there a limit to how we serve Christ? This is the part that no one likes to answer. The answer is no. Paul says, listen, you were once slave to all kinds of ugliness and sin. Now you're slaves to Christ. But it's not like being a slave to sin. You are free in your slavery to Christ to do everything that brings him honor and glory that you can possibly do. And we should take it. We should use our voices. We should use our wallets. We should use our hands and feet and protect the sanctity of life. Amen? Are you with me? Last thing I'll say, I'll be done. Someone asked me if this was our new house. Nope, no, it's not. <laughs> Thankfully, ours is a little bit bigger. Okay? we have an opportunity to support the Baptist Children's Home. And they're kind of doing a push even right now. There's a need for some resources, things like that. With everything that's going on, I'm sure they're having an influx of people who are needing help as well. They're asking for churches to step up and increase their giving and some help for the Baptist Children's Home. The Baptist Children's Home helps children and families in need, gives them a place to stay, educates them, feeds them, tries to help break some of those cycles uh, in the life of these families, generational things. And so there's been a request going on. We're going to answer that request that if we would be willing to give. We're going to have these out for a couple weeks. So if you don't have something to give today, that's fine. If the Lord lays it on your heart to give something, I'm going to leave this one right up here. On the back, the little table by the, on the door on the way out, you'll see another little wooden church back there. It has a slot on the top. You got a dollar in your pocket? Put that dollar in here if you would. All this money, none of it stays here, all this money goes right to the Baptist Children's Home, and it's going to be to help them gain resources for helping families and to honor and value life. And so I'm going to leave you right there with that. There's another practical thing that you can do to help honor life. And if you would, Garrett's going to come. We're going to worship through one more song here. Uh, but I want you to stand with me, and I just want to have a time of, of prayer and response you know, a lot of what I said, I'm sure we all nodded along. We get it, right? Abortion, bad. Life, good. But maybe the last part, we probably didn't spend enough time on this, the practical application of what you can be doing 
to help others see life as precious. That's what we got to walk away from today and go, what am I going to do? What is it we can do that other people can see and know in me that I believe life is precious, God believes life is precious, life is precious, let's protect it. And so again, maybe that's simply committing to praying for families who are fostering and raising kids and doing those things. Great. Maybe there's a practical way that you can help with those kids, a practical way that you can help with, with widows, right? People who can't, again, can't really do for themselves. You go, I'm going to make it my mission to make sure those folks are taken care of. Let's be very practical in how we live out our faith. Let's show people that life is precious, not simply tell them, right? James makes that point as well. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. This is the time for you to respond. We'll pray. I'll pray over you. And then as soon as I'm done praying, we're going to worship through one more song, and then we'll be out of here. Father, we love you. I thank you for an opportunity to be in your house, to be in your word. Father, I pray that we truly understand how precious life is. Father, I pray that we, we really understand how dark our world has become, that, that life is no longer something to be protected or valued. Uh, it's simply something we can cast away. Uh, no responsibility, no, no regrets, no remorse. Father, you didn't make us to be that way. And Father, I know it's a tremendous burden for those who have gone through that. And Father, I pray that you would heal hearts and, and heal bodies for, for ladies that have gone through that. Uh, but also, Father, there would be a great spiritual awakening that we would realize how precious life is, that we would do everything within our power and the means that you've given us. Just like you said to Jeremiah, you've ordained us and called us and given us these opportunities. Let us take it, walk in it, show people, uh, live out how precious life is. Father, I pray again you give us practical ways and opportunities to do that this week. We love you. We thank you. It's your son's name we pray. Amen.